droht uns die schlimmste Rezession aller Zeiten? Das beantwortet uns heute der Nobelpreisträger. Servus Leute und herzlich willkommen in einem brandneuen Video der Mission Money. Wir sind heute back mit einem Hochkaräter, mit einem Nobelpreisträger. Wir haben Robert Schiller gewonnen für die Mission Money und sind sehr stolz darauf. Er ist einer der bekanntesten Ökonomen der Welt und einer der einflussreichsten. Und er hat ein neues Buch geschrieben, Narrative Wirtschaft, auf Englisch Narrative Economics. Welcome Mr. Schiller. Uh, my pleasure. It's an honor to have you on our show. Uh, we used to have an appointment in Berlin, but it's a pity you had to cancel your flight concerning or uh, because of the Corona virus. And now we have to talk about this topic, of course. It's everywhere. Uh, you told uh, Bloomberg some weeks ago that you're not sure whether we see a correction or if we are already in a bear market. What is your guess today? Well, technically, a, a bear market is a 20% drop, so we're already there now. The question is, how much further might it go down? And uh, right now, uh, it's looking a little, uh, uh, a little scary. Uh, I, I, uh, I haven't sold. I'm still mostly in. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it could go down a lot further. The okay. problem is we don't know. Uh, the prices of uh, stocks have come down a great deal, and, and there's also the thought that it might be a buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, f I think it's very hard to uh, answer what, what the outlook will be, uh, because we haven't really been in a situation like this before. Uh, if you go back 100 years, it, you could go back to the 1918 flu epidemic, which was uh, similarly dangerous. Uh, but that's an awfully far time going back to make comparisons. And also it was the end of World War I at that time uh, when that came up. And so there were other things going on. Uh, it didn't cause a huge drop in the sudden drop in the market in 1918. For what that's worth, <laughs> it didn't. So I don't know what, uh, what to expect from here on. You said recently that uh, the consequences of Corona would still be underestimated. So how worse will it be or how worse could it be? Well, this is a question for an epidemiologist. Now, actually, my book that you just displayed is about epidemiology applied to economics. But in order to predict a specific epidemic, uh, I'd have to be a real epidemiologist, which I'm not. Uh, but it does suggest that epidem epidemic models do suggest that this crisis may not be over until most of us are infected, have been affected, uh, because it'll just come back. Uh, you might put everyone uh, into social distancing or the like, uh, but when you stop doing that, uh, it will just come back. So it's... it's uh, It's a serious problem that we have, it's, and it's different from usual economic problems in that it's grounded in biology. Mm. We will come to the narrative in a, a few minutes, but if the economy will stand still in the next weeks, and maybe we hope not, but maybe for a month, could it be the yeah. worst recession in history? Uh, well, it, it, it could be. <laughs> I like to talk about extremes. Uh, the people are, uh, our U.S. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin just said that it could be 20% unemployment if we don't deal with it. Mm. Uh, that puts it slightly less severe than the Great Depression, <laughs> but not, it, it's close. But I think it's different. Everything is, you know, every time someone uh, uh, changes, uh, history is always coming up with new surprises. And we have not seen a depression caused by an epidemic within uh, over a hundred years okay. or even longer than that. What is so dangerous at the moment? Um, many people talk about uh, the shock on the supply side and on the demand side. What's the real problem in your opinion at the moment? Well, actually, there are two epidemics going on 
You can call them co-epidemics since they in, inter, interact with each other. There is the, the medical epidemic, but there is also an epidemic of fear, uh, and it's driven by narratives about uh, chaos that might be coming soon. Well, one very frightening narrative is the narrative about uh, hospitals being overwhelmed mm -hmm. with sick people and then having to turn people away to die because they can't uh, deal with them. the shortage of ventilators uh, that people be having trouble breathing and we can put them on a ventilator uh, but if there aren't enough ventilators you're going to have to decide who gets one and who doesn't uh, th these are scary narratives they're still in the future but they're not so far into the future could you explain to us how a narrative works, what it is and how it works and why it could or can become so dangerous? Yeah, so the story, the word narrative uh, in the English language has come to mean a telling of a story uh, that involves some uh, meaning. The story uh, has uh, moral implications or it explains how the world works. Uh, explains mechanisms that you have to interact with in the economy. Those are economic narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the theme of my book is that economic narratives are like viruses. First of all, they spread according to the laws of epidemiology by contagion. And secondly, they, they, uh, they have many forms. They mutate. And uh, just like influenza isn't one epidemic, it's, there's many different varieties of uh, influenza. Same is true for narratives. They're difficult to study uh, because there's so many of them. They, they occur in constellations, I would say, of narratives. Narratives that, for example, about the coronavirus would be a constellation of narratives. And once people are interested in, their, in a particular narrative, they want to hear variations on it. And so the variations on it tend to spread. Uh, that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing a, a constellation of coronavirus narratives that have really captured the attention of the entire world. You are writing in your book that the moral is very important for a narrative to go viral. Could you explain it to us? And uh, the contagion rate you mentioned in your book, what is uh, the contagion rate? Yeah, well, uh, the, con the contagion rate is the percent of the population that is infected uh, per unit of time. Uh, and a high contagion rate narrative doesn't have to be a good narrative, it just has to be uh, contagious, something that people will repeat. A joke is an example of a contagious narrative. Mm -hmm. It's good if they have punchlines, if, if there is some surprise element in the story. Uh, and it's also good if the narrative um, involves a celebrity figure that we've all heard of. Or if not a celebrity figure, at least a human interest figure who might become a celebrity be through the narrative. So, for example, Greta Thunberg is, a, uh, is an example of a young woman who went, went viral with her uh, campaign for uh, sustainability. Uh, and so there's a, there's a constellation of narratives around sustainability uh, that uh, involve her in, in a substantial measure. But now all that has been pushed aside by a new narrative, coronavirus. And we're not thinking so much about sustainability at the moment. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about surviving. Mm -hmm. Did you have a Horeca moment uh, when you did your research? So what was the trigger where you saw, OK, there's definitely a connection between economics and narratives. What was the trigger for you? Well, this thing has been uh, blooming in my mind for 50 years. <laughs> When I was an undergraduate in college, I um, was impressed by a history course that I took. Uh, and I thought that maybe I'm learning more about uh, economics from the history department than from the economics department. Because it seems like the essence of uh, uh, the Great Depression, which I was studying then, back then, mm. uh, was uh, a succession of narratives that uh, 
uh, got people very anxious and unwilling to spend money. How does a crisis begin? You say in your book, what, what you mentioned right now, when people stop buying. Is that the case at the moment? Well, at the moment, we're all, it's complicated. We're, we're, we're seeing people eating out less <laughs> or uh, are going to movies less, but we see them in a buyer's panic at grocery stores trying to get stocked up. Uh, but I think the net effect is definitely negative. So uh, people are buying less than they normally would. And that, uh, by quite a wide margin, if you just stay home and do nothing, you're buying nothing practically, just yeah. food. But what would be the solution? W would you tell the people uh, try to live as normal as possible or to rescue our economy or would it be a uh, bad advice? <laughs> Well, there's no uh, good solution. It, it's a very disruptive event. Mm. But what you want to do is prevent uh, side effects as much as possible. So, so people who are staying home, uh, they don't have any money. <laughs> so they're not being paid. Uh, the businesses uh, may may go bankrupt. Businesses that work where they work because they have steady, they have to pay the rent. Uh, they've bought supplies and now they can't sell them. Uh, if it's a restaurant, the food is spoiling. <laughs> they can't. Uh, they've paid for it, and they. So it, it's creating a lot of uh, interruption-type disruptions. Um, the U.S. Uh, um, leadership uh, declared that they will give uh, money to the people. Uh, the Mewchen uh, mentioned it. Would it would it help, or does it show how bad the situation is? It's interesting that this is an embodiment of what's called the universal basic income, where you give money to everyone. <laughs> Although Mnuchin said he wouldn't give it to millionaires, but uh, most people would get uh, uh, in the thousands of dollars uh, as a as a gift from the government. Uh, some people call it helicopter money. Mm -hmm. Going back to an old story about, it's an old narrative from economists about if the government wanted to stimulate the economy, all they have to do is hire a fleet of helicopters and drop money uh, all over the place. And people would pick it up and spend it. So that's kind of what we're doing. It's not using helicopters. Uh, it's, uh, it's a revolutionary economic strategy. Uh, which I think is setting a precedent. Maybe it will. Maybe this kind of thing will happen more in the future. And then, if it's happening all the time, it's a universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Okay, but will it work? Or, in your, are you optimistic or pessimistic well, concerning the, uh, let's call it helicopter money? Yeah. Well, I think it will work in the sense that it will avoid immediate crises for some families. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important. Otherwise, we will have narratives spreading about people in desperate situations, children who are hungry, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think it will work, but it won't work completely because the disruption is real. And it's also psychological. I think a lot of people are just anxious right now. Mm -hmm. The thought that you might actually die <laughs> in a couple of weeks Yeah, focuses the mind. Mm. For me, it's uh, crucial how bad the U USA will be hit by uh, coronavirus. So, what do we expect? And is it already priced in the stock market so that the USA okay. could become real trouble or could get in real trouble? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. The stock market has fallen something like. 20-25 percent. It's not that bad. Uh, it's bad, but it's, it could be worse. In the Great Depression, it fell over 80 yes. <laughs> percent. So, uh, and it, it didn't do it all at once. It wasn't a one-day event. People talk a lot about the 1929 crash, mm. but it only fell 12 percent on the first day. So it's like what we've just seen. Uh, we saw a 12 percent drop in the Dow uh, just a few days ago. The question is whether there'll be repeated declines in the, in the stock market over years. Now, the thing that's different here when compared with the Great Depression is that this time the narrative is 
somewhat transient. This epidemic is expected to be over in a year uh, or maybe less uh, time than that. Uh, uh, it was not known for sure, obviously, but uh, in that but in that time, it will have exposed uh, maybe 70% of the population will have caught this, this uh, virus. Mm. That's what Angela Merkel said for Germany, I think. Or she yes. quoted it as an example. Uh, so, but that's still a short run. It's, it's, uh, we'll see a lot of deaths and we'll see uh, uh, a lot of economic disruption for a year. Uh, but after that, maybe it will be back to normal. And th th so that's short run uh, by the standard of the stock market. When you buy a stock, you are buying a claim on the profits going into the indefinite future, not just one year. So the market has a tendency to overreact to short run narratives. Mm -hmm. and, and so we may, be, uh, we may have already uh, overshot that the market is, uh, is down too much. And so this might be a buying opportunity. But in the meantime, it's awfully un irregular and it could, it could decline much more. That, that's, that's the big unknown. So it could drop by 80%. Um, many Wall Street guys, I read an article some days ago, um, have created uh, the word uninvestable. <laughs> so would you invest at the moment or would you be calm and wait for better times at least if it is more obvious how far it can go so how long the epidemic will uh, last on us yeah well i don't uh, i don't put myself up as an example uh, for i'm an emotional person like anyone else i sold a little bit okay uh, but still a, a substantial you know i'm half in the market uh so um Yeah, we just don't know. It's, it's an unfortunate thing that uh, people come out with forecasts, but those are stabs in the dark. Nobody knows where we're going. Uh, the, it, talking about the 80% decline in the markets in 1929 is a bit uh, in misleading because that's the worst one, the worst decline. So we don't expect, you know, when you think about this coronavirus, It, it, it's not the worst thing that ever happened, uh, it, 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 and it will, it will pass. So uh, that's why I think we shouldn't overreact. Is uh, the coronavirus a black swan, in your opinion? Yeah, a black swan refers to something that people thought couldn't happen. Uh, and so, in a sense, it's a black swan. But, but in another sense, it was predicted. There were epidemiologists have been saying all along that this is something that could happen. Uh, it's just that in our everyday thinking, we don't, uh, we don't dwell on that. It seems like it's never happened, not since 1918 at an extreme level. So uh, we just don't worry about it. Apparently that's what happened with Donald Trump, who uh, our president of the United States, who uh, shut down the uh, uh, Directorate for Global Health and prevention, which was supposed to be focusing on pandemics. He shut down the whole office that was designed to study that. And uh, now he claims he doesn't even remember doing it. <laughs> he thinks somebody else did it. So he just wasn't focused on that. We get we, There's a tendency for public opinion to focus on something uh, uh, and uh, overreact. So we were focused on immigration. Uh, and so is Germany, I think. Uh, but that wasn't our biggest problem at the moment. How would you assess um, Trump's leadership in the last days? Uh, not great. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's, you know, of course, he is the head of a big team that, of people that he appoints. Uh, but he's been, uh, the big fault might lie in his uh, uh, attitude toward employees that, He gets them fired regularly. He's replaced his chief of staff, his treasury secretary. He's done that again and again. So it creates chaos. It, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, encourage long-term thinking. 
about uh, black swan events uh, like the coronavirus. I read uh, your talk concerning Trump about uh, a possible Hoover moment for him. Uh, <laughs> could you explain it to us? <laughs> What did you mean? Well, Herbert Hoover was elected president of the United States in 1928. And in 1929, he became president before the crash. The crash occurred when he was president of the United States. Uh, and his, his, uh, his term of office was pretty much steadily downhill. <laughs> Everything was getting worse for four, uh, no, three years. Uh, and during that time, uh, Hoover thought that it was his job to boost spirits, uh, boost confidence. So he kept saying that the correction up is around the corner. Things are going to get better before you know it. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, he kept turning out to be wrong again and again. It kept getting worse, even though he kept saying it was getting better. And he became a laughing stock that Hoover again is saying it's always going to get better. I think politicians have to re uh, uh, no, Donald Trump made the same mistake with regard to the coronavirus. He gave his own forecast and said that he thought it was nothing. I'm not quoting him exactly, but he said, it'll, uh, before you know it, it'll just disappear. Uh, and so uh, he's suffering the same um, public ridicule that uh, we got for Hoover. Uh, he's coming around. He's, he now is uh, working harder to, uh, to actually deal with the epidemic. But uh, meanwhile, his reputation has been harmed, I think. Will it destroy his campaign for the election? Depends on what happens between now and the election. There's a long time still. Uh, I, I, I suspect it's not good for his re-election prospect. Uh, the markets uh, seem also to have lost faith in the Fed. So the central bank acted twice, but the markets dropped sharply. So it is a tipping point concerning the power of uh, the central banks. Yeah, well, part of the story, part of the narrative is that Interest rates now are virtually at zero in the short rate, short rates in the United States. Mm. And uh, we're, we're going to have to consider going negative. You can't go too much more. And so we've kind of out of ammunition. So he made a dramatic uh, statement by cutting interest rates a full percentage point. Uh, but now he's done. Now he could try quantitative easing, uh, which they are also trying. Uh, and but that uh, runs up against the fact that interest rates at the long end are already very low. So he is somewhat out of ammunition, and that's that's a problem. That's why I think the uh, the new proposals to for helicopter money are important, uh, and uh, they may actually bring in a new era. I th I think that we're an event like this will be remembered vividly. And uh, uh, the idea of helicopter money, that sounds kind of funny. Call it a universal basic income it is being enhanced by this e experience. And I think that will last for a long time. We can actually give people an income. Uh, and in, at least in times of crisis, it looks like we have to do that. Many people say Corona was uh, the trigger, but not the reason for this crisis. Would you agree? Uh, the stock market. Uh, and the housing market had become quite pricey. Mm. They've both been going up. Well, the stock market has been going up for 10 years, the long uh, bull market. Uh, and the housing market in, in the United States has also been rising ever since 2012. Uh, so it's a long bull market in basic assets. Uh, and so I think that there was a correction looming. But there was no reason. To, uh, we, we had corrections. We had almost, we had a correction in early 2018 where stock prices fell around 10%. And then we had another one in late 2018 when stock prices in the US fell almost 20%. But they always came back because there was no, uh, there was no story that uh, would justify this being 1929 again. Uh, and so it just came back. Now, this is not a reason, that this current story does not offer a reason to think it's 1929 again either, not necessarily.
because it's 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 really different. It's it's caused by a temporary shock uh, that will, uh, if you don't die, <laughs> you'll be okay and you'll be back to uh, normal living. Uh, so there isn't a narrative. See, in the Great Depression, there was a narrative about technological unemployment that had gotten very strong, that people thought that machines were replacing jobs, robots were replacing jobs, and that the, 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 the strength of the economy was indefinitely harmed. So, for example, in the 1930s, the dial telephone first became common. Uh, the dial telephone replaced an operator. You used to have to talk to the operator, and she would usually or she would connect you at a switchboard to your des your destination uh, when you made a phone call. But uh, with the dial telephone, that was completely automated, and so they referred to the telephone as a robot replacing jobs forever. Those jobs as, as switchboard operators. We're gone forever. I have to say, we still have some switchboard operators, but it's not as big as it once was. Uh, you are an expert for bubbles and crises, so you warned investors already in the year 2000. It's 20 years ago. Your book Irrational Exuberance was released this, uh, these days. How does a bubble develop and is a bubble all, also a narrative? Yes, a bubble is uh, as a specific kind of narrative where the impetus for the narrative has something to do with price changes, something that's valued in the marketplace and that whose price is talked about. Uh, and, and so the uh, narrative has a specific contagion. It's born out of envy for other people who thought to buy into the market uh, heavily. In fact, uh, people who were most aggressive were people who would borrow money and put it into the market. Uh, and so those people became the subject of admiration uh, and regret to, uh, for not having done that. Why didn't I see this coming? But then uh, those same people become a source of instability who borrowed money to buy uh, stocks or housing because now uh, as the market goes down, they are bankrupt or they may be bankrupt. Uh, and so uh, the story it takes an unusual twist at the bursting of the bubble. You mentioned the word flipper in your book. It was very interesting for me. Yeah. So you, uh, you told us uh, that the reason for a bubble or for a stock market crash was born earlier. So what, what is uh, the word flipper? What has it to do with this? The, 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 the English word flipper from the verb flip, like to flip a pancake or something, uh, first appeared in the 1980s. They didn't have it before that. The word appeared with regard to people who were uh, flip, flipping condominiums, uh, people who were buying real estate in urban areas uh, that was going through a speculative boom, and then selling it quickly. That's like it's flipping. You sell it within... Uh, days or months of having bought it and at a profit. Uh, so uh, it, it used to be apartment apartment buildings or condos, condominiums. But in the uh, in the 21st century, it came to be applied. Well, it was also applied to people who flipped initial public offerings or other things. But it became a very popular word in the 21st century uh, with the housing boom. Uh, where people would be uh, boasting about having made tons of money by buying multiple houses and selling them quickly. You buy them, you fix them up so that they look better, you sell them. Uh, and um, not that everyone did that. That was an uh, elite minority who did that, who actually were major flippers. But it, it, it brought publicity into the market and it encouraged people to buy uh, buy a bigger house than they would have, or try to uh, try to invest heavily, borrow more than they would have to buy a house. Because they didn't want, they want to be a little bit like a flipper. And that was a, that was a narrative, it was a constellation of narratives. But was uh, the narrative in the last years uh, for the booming stock market, um, the word flipper and the greed of the people, or also did uh, Donald Trump play a role? 
Well, yeah, greed is an important thought in, uh, uh, in the recent bull market. And Donald Trump uh, exemplifies that. Donald Trump uh, has touched a nerve. Uh, he's recognizing something that is deeply rewarding about his, his uh, leadership to many people. Uh, and you have to understand that Donald Trump is a motivational speaker. He, uh, he writes books on how to improve your life. Uh, and by taking control, uh, strong control. Uh, and uh, he also is an, uh, a campaigner for the, uh, the, uh, the, the good life. The, uh, he says you, you, in, in one of his books, maybe it was uh, Trump, How to Get Rich. Uh, uh, he wrote with Meredith McIver. Uh, he, he, he's... He says, you have to live the story. You have to, if you want to be rich, you want to start lo looking rich. Uh, and uh, uh, the story that envelops around you becomes your reputation and becomes uh, a source of wealth for you. I'm not quoting him exactly, but it's something like that in his. So people, uh, I think, uh, he also shows real contempt for, quote, losers people who uh, just uh, are hopeless. Uh, and so it led to people wanting to present themselves as winners and to spend more money, I believe. So let's come uh, to the last part, uh, your famous CAPE. So uh, the valuation of the stock market was not that low in the last years or the last month. So are stocks already cheap right now? When we just look at the K, yeah. but it's, is it hard to calculate at the moment? Well, we, we can calculate it, but the, the, the problem is, uh, uh, is it low? Uh, so if you look in Europe, uh, as of a couple of days ago, the K ratio was around 16. Uh, and uh, that is about average historically. I mean, it's roughly average. So it's not highly priced in Europe at the moment. Uh, same thing in the United States. Well, the United States is higher. It's uh, uh, as of a day or two ago, around 23. Uh, so it looks still somewhat highly priced in the U.S., but not nearly so much. So it looks like it might be a good investment. Uh, but I hate to say that right now because it's so volatile right now and it could drop a lot. I just don't know. But when it's average or even above average and Corona and the economy uh, problems are still looming, isn't it still too expensive? Yeah, I'm not advocating going in wholesale at this point, but whether you want to sell everything is another question. Uh, so some exposure to the stock market might make sense. Uh, Uh, yeah, we, we all can't get out, by the way. If we all try to get out, the market will fall to zero. <laughs> so, uh, and there has to be a point when it's a buying opportunity. So maybe we've hit that point and maybe not. I just don't know. Okay, um, when would be the market very cheap? So uh, Goldman uh, told us some days ago the S&P could find a bottom at 2,000 points. So. Where is the lowest low if it doesn't fall to th zero? <laughs> well, we, we got down to, a, in the United States, we got down to a cape of 13 in uh, uh, 2009. Mm. Uh, so that's uh, a little more than half of what it is now. Uh, in uh, 1932, we got down to something like six. <laughs> so. <laughs> It can get a lot lower. I, I, just, I wish I could forecast I, I, more accurately. I, we just don't have the ability. It, you know, trying to forecast now uh, makes one a little bit of an epidemiologist also. So it, one issue is, will, um, uh, will warmer weather uh, reduce the contagiousness of this virus? 
people still don't know the answer to that question. Mm. Well, this, uh, uh, the extreme measures taken by governments to, uh, to reduce contagion, will those work? We don't know. Uh, and another question we still don't know the answer to is how effective, once you get the coronavirus and survive, uh, how effective is your immunity and how long will that last? You might get it twice. There are examples of that, unfortunately. So there's a lot of unknowns in epidemiology uh, that we have to deal with. And then on top of that, there are the economic unknowns because we've never really had a crisis quite like this before. So we need uh, positive news now. Uh, is it possible to um, influence a narrative like coronavirus? Uh, could we turn it positive or more positive in some way? Or is it n simply not possible to control a narrative or influence it? Uh, I, th I think it is possible. And we have to rely on the instincts of the narrative builder. It's not easy to construct a contagious counter narrative that counters this frightened narrative that accompanies economic uh, interaction. We mentioned already Herbert Hoover, who tried to with restore confidence and it didn't work. Um, so I think that it's important for government figures to, uh, to, to do a convincing case that they're, that they're re responding well to the, uh, to the crisis. For all of us, I think there's, some, uh, uh, there's something for, to be gained by us all showing a sense of camaraderie with our fellow citizens mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, a, a moment of uh, support for everyone. Uh, that that will help, but it is it is substantially a disease epidemic that's not going to go away by economic measures alone. Thank you so much, Mr. Schiller. Leute, jetzt bin ich gespannt auf euer Feedback. Das war leider nicht die optimale Tonqualität, aber gut, was soll man jetzt erwarten? Momentan das WLAN ist überlastet und ich glaube, es war trotzdem ein sehr, sehr spannendes Gespräch. Sehr sympathisch, Robert Schiller. Und jetzt würde mich euer Feedback interessieren. Er hat es auf den Punkt gebracht. Es ist momentan sehr schwer, das Ganze vorauszusagen. Es kann natürlich keiner, aber trotzdem würde mich interessieren, seid ihr jetzt eher optimistisch und sagt, ja gut, das sind jetzt noch ein paar Wochen, ich investiere jetzt ganz dick. Jetzt gibt es einfach die Aktien billiger. Wir haben es gerade gehört. Es ist noch nicht spottbillig, aber es ist natürlich viel, viel billiger als noch vor ein paar Wochen. Oder sagt ihr, um Gottes Willen, ich gehe davon aus, dass jetzt da ein Dominostein nach dem nächsten umfällt und ich warte jetzt erstmal noch ein paar Wochen, vielleicht sogar zwei, drei Monate ab. Ich bin sehr gespannt auf euer Feedback. Danke fürs Zuschauen. Wir sind jetzt raus. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Ciao.